Today we're going to be discussing uh, some simple design considerations for the first time in the class. So up until this point we've just been discussing primarily analysis techniques. So given a structure that's already been designed, trying to understand the stresses and strains and so on in the structure. So today what we're going to do is flip that a little bit and we're going to <clears throat> discuss kind of how to um, go in the other direction, which is you don't exactly know all the parameters of the design, but you may know, for example, some yield stresses or other um, quantities that you have to you have to make sure that you meet in the design. And uh, we're going to discuss how that looks for a very simple setting, where we just basically have tension. We have um, uh, members in axial tension or compression, or bolts in shear, because that's all that we've discussed so far. Um, the basic design criteria today that we're going to discuss is basically sizing members. So given some load that comes from statics and some allowable stress that comes from the material that we're using, we can take the load and divide it by the allowable stress to figure out what the required area is to carry that load. And again, all of the same assumptions still hold as before, that we have to have uniformly distributed stresses and that the loads are acting through the centroid. And I'll also do a little bit of statics today. We're going to consider this example here, where we have a structure where you've got a, a long um, beam that has a pin support on the left, and there are two pulleys that are supporting a sign that's attached. And so you can see all the geometric parameters and that this is one of the assumptions from statics is that this is going to be a frictionless pulley and these are cables. The material is going to be steel and the weight of the sign is going to be 1,500 pounds. Um, a couple allowable stresses are given, so these would be things you would look up for the particular mirror, uh, material that we're using. So the allowable shear that we're going to use in the pins is going to be 6.5 kips per square inch. And so the pins are right here, and I believe we're going to have some pins here and here. Okay, and We're going to assume those pins are in double shear. Then for the steel member here that's going to be loaded axially, we're going to have an allowable stress in tension and compression, and they're going to be different. And that's pretty pretty normal that material will behave differently depending on whether it's in tension or compression. Okay, so we're going to begin by cutting the structure away from the wall and away from the sign, and then just looking at the free body diagram of the entire structure. So we've cut it away right here at point A, and we've cut it away up here at point B, and then we've cut it away at point E and point F, and then the load is assumed to be distributed equally. So these are the resultant forces coming from the sign. Okay. We don't yet know these angles, alpha, beta, Alpha, alpha B and Alpha C. We're going to have to figure that out. And then because we cut this away, we have some resultant forces from statics that we're going to have to figure out. So the first thing we're going to do, step one, is we're going to sum the moments. Okay, now we're going to start with moments about point D. So we're going to start up here summing the moments about that point. So the first force we have is this one right here, AX and its moment arm is six feet and it's acting in a counterclockwise direction so it's it's positive so that's this guy right here then we also have um, the w over two these guys are one is a distance 1.5 feet and then another one is a distance 1.5 plus 2.5 plus 3.5 so that's 7.5 feet and they're both acting clockwise so they're going to be negative so here's those two moments. And that has to all equal zero. And so now the only unknown left in this equation is A 
x, and so we can solve for it. It ends up being 1,125 pounds. So that's, that's this guy that we've taken care of. So that's good. Now we're going to use another equation from statics. We're going to sum the forces in the x direction. And in this case, it's quite simple. We just have ax here and dx here. They're both acting in the same direction, which means that dx has to be the negative of ax, which is just minus 1,125 pounds. And so now we know ax and we know dx. Now, in order to proceed, we need to figure out a little bit more of the geometry of this problem by figuring out the angles alpha b and alpha c. Fortunately, these are both just simple right triangles, so we can figure them out quite in a quite simple way. So if we want to know alpha b, we just take the tangent of alpha b is going to be opposite the opposite guy which is this distance here, 6 feet, and then um, over the adjacent length, which in this case is going to be 4 feet because it's 1.5 plus 2.5 feet. Okay, so we can solve for alpha beta, and it's going to be alpha b, and it's going to be 56.31 degrees. And likewise, we can do the same for alpha C, okay, which is right here. Okay, so now what we're going to do is um, go ahead and create a, a, a more uh, detailed or closer up um, free body diagram. We're actually going to cut the cables. So if you look here, we've went ahead and cut the cables away now. Um, and then we can figure out the resulting forces. So we're going to sum the forces in the x direction at d. Right? So this is a smaller free body diagram. That's OK. You can have multiple free body diagrams as long as every free body diagram ends up in equilibrium when you're done. So we're going to sum the forces in the x direction, set them equal to 0. So we have d sub x, okay, which we've already solved for. That's a known quantity that we got before. And then we're going to have um, a value of um, force in the x direction coming from each of these, the tension in each of these cables. And because this is a frictionless pulley, we assume that the force in each cable is the same. So it's T in each of them. That just comes from some of the simplifications that you learned in statics. And so what we want to do is we want to take this vector t, there's one here and there's one here, we want to figure out the component of t in the x direction because that's going to contribute to the sum of the forces in the x direction. So the first one we do is at point b we take t times cosine, t times cosine of alpha b will give us this vector. And then t times cosine of alpha c will give us that vector. Okay, so that's the two vectors. And then, because t is constant, we can pull it out and solve for t. So now we know the tension in the pulleys. Okay, now we can do the same thing uh, at joint d, but this time summing the forces in the y direction. So the same thing we did in step four, we're going to do in step five, just in another direction. So in this case, instead of cosines, we're going to use sines. And then we can solve for d sub y. Okay. And that comes out to be 1189.23. Okay, now, we're getting pretty close to um, being done with statics, we've got most of the resultant forces. We have the tension in the cable. We have the um, forces at, at uh, the top and the bottom pins. Now we're going to compute some resultant forces so that we can compute the, the shear and the pins. So we're going to compute the resultant at D, 
is we just take the square root of the sum of the squares of the each of the components of d in the x and y direction. So that gives us the total shear force right on the pin, which is going to be in double shear. So we're going to end up dividing that by 2. Okay. Um, we can sum forces in the y direction again to solve for a sub y, okay, which gives us this value here. Um, and uh, so this is the last, step seven really is the last thing that we're going to do with statics in this problem. So now we have uh, a sub y, a sub x, d sub y, d sub x, the tension in the pulley, and all the geometry. So you have the angles. Um, okay, so now let's compute just as we did it for the resultant force at D, we compute the resultant force at A, which is this value here. Okay. And so now we can compute, for example, the shear stress in those pins at point A and point D using those resultant forces. So now we um, we know all these values. Okay, we know all there. We filled in all of the unknowns. So now we can turn to uh, computing some of the design aspects of this. So first thing that we want to do is we want to determine the shear forces and the required diameter of all the pins. Okay. So we have. A pin here that we're going to do first and then we're going to do a pin at B and a pin at C but notice that the tension at B and the tension at C are actually equivalent because we have a frictionless pulley so if we do B we know C okay so the pin at A if we want to know the area right we're going to take the force right what how, how does this normally work right so if you want to have the um, uh, you want to know the area you're going to take the resultant force and divide it by the the yield stress if you recall we were given some maximum allowable values for shear stress so here's what we're using so here's the maximum allowable value for shear stress and so that's going to end up here in the denominator, right? Because if you were, to, this is, this right here is our tau allowable, right? So we have the area of the pin is equal to the resultant force, right, at A divided by tau allowable. So that's what we're doing here, right? And that makes sense because if you were to re rearrange here and put tau over on the left and put A in the denominator, then you'd have a force per area. But this is a, we're now kind of working backwards because we don't yet know what the uh, cross-sectional area of the pin needs to be in order for it to carry this load and not exceed this particular shear stress. Okay, and so if you do the simple calculation, you're going to get that the cross-sectional area has to be equal to this. And so using pi d squared over 4 and then solving for d, you can get that that's the diameter that's allowed. So you use this diameter and you apply this resultant force, the resultant stress should be less than or equal to the tau allowable. Notice the 2 here. This is coming from double shear. There's two sides to the bolt, so we distribute it equally on both sides. Pin at B is very similar. The cross-sectional area, again, is going to be now the tension in the cable. Again, double shear. Here, double shear. That's why the two. And then we divide by 6.5, again, which is the allowable shear stress in the pins. So then we get this value here. Okay. And then pin C is exactly the same as B. Okay, good. So now we've got the sizing of the pins. So that's we're halfway there. Completed the statics to get all of the resultant forces, and then once we have the resultant forces, we can come back 
size the pins using allowable values of stress, shear stress. But now we can also determine the axial force in, um, let's see, the axial force in the cable BDC and the area of the cable. Okay. okay, so we already know the axial force, for example, in this cable. It's just the tension T. Okay. So the area of the cable, again, we're doing the exact same thing we did with pins, except now it's just, now we're just looking at, we're just treating the cable as if it was an axial member in uh, tension. The, the cable is in tension. So we have, again, the force in the pulley divided by the allowable normal stress. See, now we're using normal stress because we're designing the cross-sectional area of a cable. So now we're back to the first section of the class, and we know that we're in tension because it's a cable. And so we can size the cable, and we end up with this area for the cable. Now the last step is we we now know, for example, the forces um, that have developed in the different from A to B and from B to C. Okay, so we know the the areas. Um, I mean, we know the the axial forces that will develop between A and B and B and C, and they're going to be different because you have this, these cables coming down. Right? And so that's why you have more force in this member because there's an X component of force coming from this cable here. Okay. And then uh, this cable, this, this part of the, of the bar doesn't have as much because it's not, it doesn't have two cables acting on it, just one. So for design, what we're going to do is we're just going to take the larger value. We want this to be a single steel pipe. So we want that single steel pipe to have one cross-sectional cross -sectional area. And so we're just going to take this as the controlling value for design because it's the larger amount of force. And again, same, same equation, except now we are in compression, right? We're in compression. Okay. And then we, we solve the equation. So in summary, in, by working this problem, we reviewed some basic principles of statics, which included multiple free body diagrams, uh, the idea of a frictionless pulley. Then once we were able to solve for all of the resultant forces, we were able to then use some of the basic analysis principles of shear and normal stress to size members. And so since we've only studied bolts and shear and axial members and tension and compression, those are the only design considerations that we could that we could deal with at this point in the class. And so we sized some bolts and double shear and we sized the steel um, the steel bar that's holding up the sign using the resultant forces we got from statics.